Hello everybody, welcome back. I hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to have a look at the ventricular system in the brain as well as identifying some of these subarachnoid cisterns. And let's start by having a look at this diagram here showing the four ventricles of the brain. We have our lateral ventricles out laterally, the largest of the four ventricles coming here. Then connecting to this middle ventricle, our third ventricle, which then comes down and connects to our fourth ventricle here. So our lateral ventricles are the largest, and we can, if we look laterally like this onto the ventricles, we can see our anterior horn, the body of the lateral ventricles, coming down into our atrium or our trigone, backwards into the occipital horn, and then coming down all the way into the temporal lobe, our temporal horns of our lateral ventricles. Now th this diagram has quite a large gap between them, but it's normally very close, just a thin sheet of tissue separating them, the septum pellucidum. We'll have our corpus callosum coming across the top here. And laterally, as you've seen from previous videos, we'll have our chordate nucleus coming right the way laterally to these lateral ventricles. Those lateral ventricles then feed down into our third ventricle via our interventricular foramen, both on the left and right hand side. Coming into this narrow third ventricle that lies between the two thalami and the hypothalami. We can see there's a hole here. This is in, only seen in some patients. That's where the thalami touch, and that's what's known as an interthalamic adhesion. Posteriorly to that third ventricle, we'll have our pineal gland. We have our cerebral aqueduct coming down to our, our fourth ventricle. The floor of this third ventricle is our midbrain coming up with our mammillary bodies here. And then anterior to that will be our pituitary. This is our infundibular recess here. And anterior to the pituitary is our optic chiasm. So this is our optic recess here. And then there's a thin sheet of tissue coming on the anterior portion of the third ventricle. That's what's known as the lamina terminalis. So our third ventricle feeds down through the midbrain into our fourth ventricle. Our fourth ventricle is bordered anteriorly by the pons and posteriorly by the cerebellum, making this classic triangle or diamond shape here. And then we have these lateral apertures here as well as this median aperture and then we have a uh, connection with our uh, central canal of our spinal column. So I just wanted to show you this diagram here so we can understand now when we go into our scans what we're looking for when we're cutting through those axial and sagittal slices. So we'll start by having a look at this axial T1 weighted scan and we can see we're at the level of our basal ganglia here. We've got our lateral ventricles and part of our third ventricle. So let's scan all the way up to the top of our lateral ventricles until they disappear out of view, and then we're going to scan down slowly. So we can see our lateral ventricles separated by this thin membrane here, the septum pellucidum, and we'll follow the anterior horns coming forward here, our chordate nucleus to the side. This is our genu of our corpus callosum and our splenium of our cor corpus callosum here. And you can see our lateral ventricles are quite small, and this is a young patient with a nice full non-atrophied brain. We can see that those anterior horns come out there and then connect with this interventricular foramen into our third ventricle. Let's scan back up again. Forget about the third ventricle for now. We're going to follow this lateral ventricle down. We'll see it give off our occipital horns here. Small occipital horns in this patient coming off backwards and then we can follow them further down. Let's look on the left hand side of the patient. We'll see that this comes all the way down into our temporal lobe here. These are our temporal horns of the lateral ventricle. Now why is uh, knowing about the ventricles so important? Well, for me the ventricles provide major clues to other things that are going on within the brain. They act as good red flags or smoke signals where we can see if there's a mass in the brain we may have um, compression of one of those lateral ventricles. If there's increased intracranial pressure or herniation, we might get obliteration of some of those ventricles. Or if there's a mass blocking CSF flow we'll, and causing some hydrocephalus, we can then see ex expansion of those ventricles. It also shows us in older patients when the brain atrophies, we get that ex vacuo dilatation of the ventricles where the ventricles get larger. And we need to just be comfortable with looking at many, many scans, seeing that the ventricles vary quite a lot between patients. But if we can see something that's abnormal, we can often look for a primary cause that's causing these secondary abnormalities in the ventricles. It also helps us to localize lesions. If there's lesions in specific regions, they're more likely to be certain diagnoses when they're related to the ventricles or not. And then if we had interventricular blood, 
we can see often in these um, occipital horns or gravity dependent regions remember these patients are lying flat in an mri scanner that blood can then settle on those gravity dependent regions and we can look for interventricular blood so we've looked at our lateral ventricles let's go have a look at our third ventricle so we can see our interventricular foramen coming down into our third ventricle the ventricle is flanked by those two thalami let's head further down in the scan now so we can see we're at the level of our third ventricle here here is our third ventricle, our thalami on the side. This is a cistern that we'll talk about later. Let's follow this third ventricle down. We can see it narrows right down into the cerebral aqueduct. We're now getting into the level of the midbrain. That cerebral aqueduct will head down. We follow it down, follow it down. We can see posteriorly we have our cerebellum. We have our inferior portion of our midbrain here. We're going to just now transition to pons. And we can see our fourth ventricle here between the pons and the cerebellum. Coming down, 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 we see our lateral apertures. Lateral apertures, otherwise known as foramen of Lushka, lateral Lushka. And then as we head further down, we see our medial aperture coming down. That's also known as the foramen of Majendi, median Majendi. And then also we're continuous with our central canal of our spinal cord. So let's have a look at a sagittal T1 image and try and follow those ventricles again. I'm going to go ahead all the way out to the peripheries. Our most lateral uh, ventricle that we will find is the temporal horn of our lateral ventricle. So let's start there. We have our temporal horn coming here, head it giving off our occipital horn. We can head up into the trigone or the atrium, head all the way to the body of those lateral ventricles and the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle we can see our chordate nucleus running lateral to that lateral ventricle. As we head further, we can follow that lateral ventricle down and hopefully we can see there our interventricular foramen coming down into our third ventricle. So here we have our third ventricle. You can see the fornix coming down. That will head down towards these mammillary bodies. That thin sheet of tissue at the front, our lamina terminalis coming towards our optic chiasm. Then we have our second, our infundibular recess coming down towards our pituitary here. We can see sitting in the cella is our sphenoid sinus. We've got this flaw here caused by the, the superior aspect here of our midbrain. Either side of that are our cerebral peduncles coming down, our pineal gland at the back. And then we can see we've cut right down the midline. We can see our cerebral aqueduct coming down now into our fourth ventricle. And our fourth ventricle, we can see our median aperture here. And just very carefully, we can see our central canal of the spinal cord. So that's where our CSF is within our ventricles. Now, where is the CSF produced? Well, it's produced in the choroid plexus. And we mentioned earlier in a previous talk that our, our seventh division of our internal carotid artery gives off our anterior choroid. That's heading to the lateral ventricles. There's also a posterior choroid artery as well as a choroid artery coming off the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So where do we find that choroid plexus? Well, let's go into our temporal horns. The choroid extends from the temporal horns. It runs along the roof of the, of the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle, all the way up along the floor of our lateral ventricle, and then heads into the third ventricle and runs along the roof of the third ventricle. So if you can imagine that choroid plexus coming along the roof of those temporal horns, through the trigone, along the body of the lateral ventricles, heading down into the third ventricle and running along the roof of the third ventricle. There's no choroid plexus within our occipital horns or our anterior horns. It runs continuously like that. And in some patients it's really big, some patients it's difficult to see. And then we also get uh, choroid plexus along this floor here of our fourth ventricle. We get it along that vellum there. Now that we're in the sagittal plane and we are at our midline, it's a good time to talk about the subarachnoid cisterns. And some people find this quite confusing, and the best place to learn it is on the sagittal T1 section here. We can see our fluid is dark. And this, these are areas where our pia mater is against the brain surface, but our arachnoid is allowing for some space away from those brain surfaces. So it's generally in the folds of our brain where that arachnoid is away from our pia that we get these cisterns. And these cisterns are generally... The flow of CSF is continuous through all of them, and we've kind of drawn arbitrary lines, and they're more for us to know where in the brain we're describing. That's why we've named them, so we can, if we say something is in the uh, interpeduncular cistern, another radiologist will know where we're talking about. 
the best place to start is at the top. So we'll start with the cistern here. So this is our lamina terminalis coming here, that thin sheet of tissue on the anterior portion of our third ventricle. And this is what's known as the cistern of the lamina terminalis. Fairly easy to remember. It's anterior to that lamina terminalis. As we come down, we can see where our optic chiasm comes, and we can see our infundibular store coming to our pituitary gland. This has got two names. We can either call it the supracellar cistern, so the cistern above the cella, above the cella tersica, or it can be called our chiasmatic cistern, where our optic chiasm is. That's anterior now to this cistern here, which has at the roof of it our mammillary bodies, and this is what's known as our interpeduncular cistern. And we'll see when we look at axial slices, it's between the cerebral peduncles, our interpeduncular cistern here. It's anterior to the midbrain. Wrapping round the midbrain then are our ambient cisterns, which connect our interpeduncular cistern, come our ambient cisterns all the way around to our quadrigeminal cisterns at the back here. We've got our superior and inferior colliculi sitting here. We can see them there, one bump two bump, there's two of them paired, so a total of four colliculi in our tectum of our midbrain, and that behind that is our quadrigeminal cistern. So our tegmentum of the midbrain here, cerebral aqueduct, tectum, quadrigeminal cistern, and then posterior to that, this is what's known as the superior cerebellar cistern, which is above the cerebellum, below the um, tent that's separating the cerebellum from the cerebrum. As we head our way further down, we have our prepontine cistern, a really easy cistern to remember. It's before the pons, prepontine. Then wrapping round, we have our cerebellopontine cistern between the cerebellum and the pons. And that's where our lateral apertures will uh, have CSF communicating with our ventricular system out into those cisterns. Then we have our premedullary cistern, again, before the medulla oblongata, and our cerebellomedullary cistern coming round, easy to remember. And then our larger cistern at the base of the brain here coming through our foramen magnum is what's known as our cisterna magna. If we have increased pressures and the patient is coning for whatever reason or we've got low hanging cerebellar tonsils, we can have obliteration of this cisterna magna. So we've seen that in cross section. Let's have a look at our axial T1 and go and identify those cisterns. I'm going to head all the way up now. We can see our lateral ventricles. Let's find our third ventricle and let's find that thin sheet of tissue at the front of our third ventricle. We can see it forming here, our lamina terminalis. Now anterior to that will be our cistern of our lamina terminalis and that should be slightly superior to our supracellar cistern. So let's go down and see if we can identify our supracellar cistern. You can see our mammillary bodies here. We're going to have to head further down. Our optic chiasm, we see it forming there. We can see the stalk of our pituitary, so we know we're just above the cella. So this is what will be our supracellar cistern here. If we head down, we should be able to see that here's the supracellar cistern, here's the pituitary stalk. We head further down, we should be able to then see that pituitary. You can see our carotids coming up. So this is our supracellar or our chiasmatic cistern. Let's come back up to the level of the midbrain. We go down, we can see our cerebral peduncles here. So this is our interpeduncular cistern, our ambient cistern, the cistern that surrounds the midbrain, like ambient temperature, surrounding temperature, ambient cistern coming across to our quadrigeminal cistern, where we can see our superior colliculi here and our inferior colliculi below it. Here, posterior to that, is our superior cerebellar cistern. And then let's head down into the pons. We can see our prepontine cistern, our cerebellopontine cistern, you can see our trigeminal nerve coming out there, we know where that goes. Superior orbital fissure, foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, if you don't know where those go, have a look at our uh, skull-based foramen video. We're going to head down into the medulla oblongata, we've got our premedullary uh, cistern, our cerebellomedullary cistern, and then heading down into the cisterna magna at the bottom and our spinal cord heading further down. So I hope that's helped. I hope you can see where the ventricles lie within the brain as well as where those subarachnoid cisterns are and how the CSF flows in between them. Now the CSF will eventually end up in that subarachnoid space after it's come out the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, fourth ventricle, out of the uh, lateral and median aperture into those subarachnoid space. And then it's resorbed into the blood 
in our superior sagittal sinus and our transverse sinuses through our arachnoid granulations and that process is repeated multiple times a day we replace our CSF many times throughout the day. So I hope that's helped let me know what anatomy you want me to cover next I'll see you all in the next video goodbye everybody.